Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center's Curator's Corner Program. My name is Thorin Tritter. I am the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Before we start, I have been saying this in my recent programs, and I just want to emphasize our building is open. So I'm continuing to do the virtual programming, but if you're interested in seeing some of the objects that I have spoken about over the last year and a half, please come to our building and see the whole exhibition and see the objects in person. We're open Monday to Friday from 10 to 4.30 and on Saturday and Sunday from noon to four. So call if you want to get a guided tour a week in advance, but otherwise just come and walk through the museum. I also want to encourage you, before I get started, I wanna encourage you to pose any questions you have through the Q&A function of Zoom and I will make sure to make time at the end of my program to answer your questions if I can. Okay, so today I want to focus on three items that are in our second gallery, some pages from an anti-Semitic children's book that was printed in Germany in 1936. The pages come from Hofstra University's Kraul collection, which is named for Henry Kraul, a Jewish American who fought during World War II and became interested in the way Nazi ideology had been spread through not only political speeches, but in various mundane texts, such as advice books or coffee table books or children's books. And in 1969, Hofstra University purchased the collection from Henry Crowell, and it remains committed to maintaining and preserving the holdings which demonstrate how easily the tools and ideas of education can be corrupted. So we're very grateful for Hofstra University's involvement with our exhibition. The pages that I wanna talk about today are relatively small and easy to over overlook when walking through our gallery. And yet with close inspection, they are particularly disturbing. And so I think actually Zoom provides a very nice format for how to look at these photos in detail. Even without seeing anything more about the pictures than what you see on the screen now, I think you can tell that they were designed for children. They have uh, bright colors and they're drawn to catch a child's eye. Smiling people, animals in the photo, uh, in the pictures, all of that a hint at the fact that these were children's books from a children's book. They are from a children's book in particular that was entitled Trau keinem Fuchs auf Gruner Heide und keinem Jud which translates to trust no fox on the meadow, on the green meadow, and no Jew on his oath. The title actually comes from a quote from Martin Luther's 1543 pamphlet entitled On the Jews and Their Lies. Martin Luther, of course, the founder of Lutheranism, who launched the Protestant Reformation in 1517 with his posting of 95 theses on the doors to the cathedral in Wittenberg. Just a side note, for those of you who have seen the beer stein that stands in our first gallery, this is an anti-Semitic beer stein from the 1890s in Germany, and it has five anti-Semitic quotes on top. One of them is this very line that became the title for this children's book, but comes from Martin Luther's 1543 pamphlet. Um, the children's book was published in 1936. It was written by Elvira Bauer, illustrated by Philip Ruprecht, who's an artist who went by the name, pen name Phipps, and published by Sturmer Verlag. The key thing here is all three of these people or, or uh, you know, institutions, they're all private individuals. This is not something that was published by the state, by the Nazi state, not by the Nazi party. Uh, Elvira Bauer, a private individual who wanted to publish a book, she got a private artist to do the, write, the drawings with her and published it with a private publisher. Elvira Bauer was an 18-year-old German kindergarten teacher in 1936 when she wrote this book. And she is an example of the many Germans in the 1930s who embraced Nazi propaganda and the Nazi ideology. There were, of course, many in Germany who did not support Hitler initially or who opposed him after they saw what the Nazis were doing. But we should not forget that the Nazi party won more than 13 million votes in July, in the July 1932 election and more than 17 million votes in March of 1933, the largest of any party running at the time. Elvira was a member of the war youth generation, 
born in the wake of World War I and brought up believing that the only reason Germany lost World War I was because they were stabbed in the back by Jews and communists who worked to undermine the war effort from within Germany. Her children's book was an effort to teach German children about the deceitfulness of Jews, which she apparently believed wholeheartedly. So she looks quite innocent, but under that cover was really a, a, a seething mind of hate. The publisher, Sturmer Verlag, was a division of a much more well-known publication, Der Sturmer, owned by the Nazi party stalwart Julius Stryker. Not owned by the party, but owned by Julius Stryker, who was himself a supporter of the Nazi party. Julius Stryker had joined the Nazi party in 1921, when the party was still a very small and fringe organization, at least on the political scene in Germany. And in 1923, he launched Der Sturmer, the attacker, to promulgate anti-Semitic attacks and quickly established it as the place where screaming headlines introduced the most rabid attacks on Jews full of sexual innuendo and racist caricatures. Copies of the paper like these that I have on the screen here were common sites in Germany by the 1930s. And indeed we have several copies in our own gallery. Two years after the publication of Trust No Fox, on the Green Meadow, Stryker would go on to publish another strident anti-Semitic children's book called Der Giftplitz, The Poisonous Mushroom or The Toadstool. In between, he published a pamphlet specifically for teachers entitled The Jewish Question in Education, where he urged teachers to incorporate anti-Semitism into every part of their curriculum. So this is a guy who believed wholeheartedly in the message the Nazis were we're spouting about the hatred of Jews and the, the Jews being a problem. And so he publishes um, the children's book that we have on display as well as other things. And I should add that the poisonous mushroom, frightening, was still sold on Amazon until last year, 2020. Here's a Newsweek article that reports the recent move by Amazon to stop selling the poisonous mushroom on February 24th, 2020, last February not this past one, previous. There's one important link that connects Elvira Bauer's book with Der Sturmer and The Poisonous Mushroom, and that is the illustrator, Philip Ruprecht, who went by the pen name Phipps. Phipps was the illustrator for The Poisonous Mushroom, as you can see his name on the cover here. And if you look at many of the cartoons and drawings in Der Sturmer, you can also find Phipps' name on those. Phipps or Ruprecht is one of Julius Stryker's most trusted tools in his effort to spread hate. And he is also one, the one person, the man, responsible for the children's drawings in the children's book we have on display. I'll add that Phipps and Stryker were both arrested by the US Army at the end of the war in 1945. Phipps was tried by a German denazification court and sentenced to six years of hard labor. Stryker was tried by the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, where he was convicted and hanged based on the ruling that his repeated articles calling for the annihilation of the Jews were a direct indictment to murder and a crime against humanity. Anyway, we have three pages of this book on display, and I want to show them to you in detail. Here is the first one. And I think it's a bit hard just without seeing the text here to understand what's being depicted, but maybe you can get a sense of it. What you're looking at is actually a pair of images that represent a before and after shot. So a kind of time-lapse set of drawings. The top image is the before picture. And you can see that the door says Dr. Chaim somebody. So Chaim, a Jewish name. So we've got a Jewish guy in this office. And then below his name, it says at least most of the word for Rechtsanwalt, Rechtsanwalt, the, which means a, a rights advocate, a lawyer. So the main figure in the black clothing uh, on the top and the bottom is a Jewish lawyer. And you can see he's skinny in the top, but he is fat on the bottom. So he's gained weight over the course of time. The other people in the drawing who look healthy in the top picture and gaunt in the bottom are a German farmer and his wife. 
Note that in the top picture, they have a little sack of money on their belts, which is full. And by the bottom picture, it has been empty. So the farmers go from healthy and rich to gaunt and poor, while the Jewish lawyer goes from thin to fat. The text that accompanied the drawing adds further explanation. I won't read the whole thing, but you can see our farmer Michael goes to town. He's got a date with a sharp attorney. Next to them, the lawyer may be seen. He's looking very poor and mean. Just now his trade is very slack from farmer Michael. He expects a whack. The end is sad to this long tale. The farmer had to go to court. So long the Jewish lawyer fought, primed with the farmer's butter and eggs. Now round and plump and plump and round, the Jew lawyer weighs 240 pound. The farmer won the case, but wonders who his goods and money took. They were stolen all by the Jewish crook. Looking back at the picture, I think you can see how it pairs with that story, capturing the essence with only two small drawings. This lawyer who takes advantage of the um, country German folk and takes all their money and benefits from it. The second page we have in our gallery shows a school. And on an initial glance, I think it looks kind of like the end of day, all the kids are leaving. But a closer look so shows there's more going on here. At first, there are two types of children depicted, those with happy pink faces. And then if you look, you'll see there's these other kind of disturbing, dark, strange faces. Here's a zoomed in look at those happy pink faces. You can see they all look lovely. And then these, again, strange, dark faces, tongues sticking out, strange facial features. Elvira Bauer's book paired this picture with the following text. Here's the translation. It's gonna be fine in the schools at last for all the Jews must leave. For big and small, it's all alike. Anger and rage do not avail, nor utmost Jewish wine nor wail. Away with the Jewish breed. Tis the German teacher we desire. Now he leads the way to cleverness, wanders and plays with us, but yet keeps us children in good order. He makes jokes with us and laughs. So going to school is quite a joy. With the text, I think the picture makes more sense. The Jews who have the dark faces are being kicked out of the school and the non-Jewish so-called Aryan kids are celebrating. You can even see some of the pink, pink happy faces um, pointing fingers and taunting the Jewish children. This girl, there we go, uh, is pointing the way for the Jews to get out. And here's the boy rubbing his fingers together saying something like tisk, tisk, tisk. And these boys are waving but with a kind of malicious look in their face. The reading also clear, clarifies the adult dark figure in the picture shown wearing a kippah or a yarmulke. The accompanying text includes the line, tis the German teacher we desire. So here we have the Jewish teacher stereotyped as dark and fat and odd looking with a large nose compared to the light pink Aryan teacher who's staying at the school. The final picture from the book is less subtle and normalized an aspect of German life that was happening in 1936, the closing of public spaces to Jews. The Jews here are once again depicted as dark with bulbous noses. To the 21st century eye, I think they look surprisingly dark, perhaps even uh, it doesn't fit with the stereotypes today, but German propaganda highlighted the blonde and light Aryan versus the dark and swarthy Jew. Even the Jewish dog is shown here as dark. And the side that, sign that they're reading as they come to this park says, Jews are not wanted here. As with other pages, there was a text that accompanied this picture. Here you can see the translation. It starts by highlighting the beauty of the German natural surroundings, but then concludes, a notice board is erected here telling for all the world to know, here Jews are not wanted. The German is the owner here, so friend Yed, Yid, please best disappear. Where the drawings about the lawyer needed the explanation to understand them, and the drawing of the school required a close look, here the text is hardly needed. The picture with its sign says it all. These three pictures are, of course, 
only part of the book, which contained 21 different drawings. But even in just these three, you can see the effort to inflame anti-Semitism. The second, sorry, the first picture highlighted the Jews could not be trusted. The second suggested that it was perfectly okay to taunt and bully Jews. And the third normalized the idea of discrimination and segregation. Let me make one more point. I want you to think about the impact of long-term exposure to books like this. For a child who was four or five in 1936 and who graduated from this book to The Poisonous Mushroom and then eventually to Der Sturmer, not to mention the pronouncements of government figures and public speeches and speeches on the radio, the fact is they could not be unaffected. We sometimes forget how long the Nazis were in power and the gradual changes to people's moral compasses that they were able to bring about, that the Nazis were able to bring about. By 1940, the Nazis had ruled with complete authority for seven years. For seven years, they had been using every platform at their disposal to change people's understandings, emphasizing the Jews were bad, that it could, they could be treated sub, as subhuman, that it was okay to hate, in fact, it was good to hate Jews. The pages we have on display come from a book that was part of a much larger effort to re-educate German children in particular to embrace Nazi ideology through not only books and magazines, but on the radio, through schools, and in the Hitler Youth. The pages of our uh, book look bright and pleasant, but the message they convey is dark and sinister. What they emphasize to me is just how easy it is to teach hatred. And so they are a call for me to the need for us all to work equally hard to combat the hatred and to instead teach compassion, particularly to the youngest among us who will be the leaders of the next generation. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and I'll do what I can to answer them. And let me always, as always, um, mention a few of our other upcoming programs. On Monday, August 16th, we're holding a book talk with Professor Edward Westerman about his recent book, Drunk on Genocide. He has done some powerful research about what enabled Nazi soldiers to commit the acts of atrocity that they did. And I hope you will join us to hear directly from him about what he has uncovered. Then on Tuesday, August 17th, 7 p.m., we are holding a program with Melinda Wenner Moyer, an award-winning science journalist who has just come out with a book entitled, excuse my French, How to Raise Kids Who Aren't Assholes. She is gonna talk specifically about how to prevent people from growing up to be racists, drawing on a wealth of social science research that she has brought together for her book. So uh, she's gonna be talking about stuff that how to combat the children's book that we have in our gallery. And one more program to mention next Wednesday, sorry, not next Wednesday, Wednesday the 18th, I'll be back for my next Curator's Corner at 11 a.m. to talk about the Feldafing Displaced Persons Camp, which we have several photographs of in our gallery. So you can find details about these programs and all our upcoming programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org. And I hope if you go to our website, you will also click the Give Now button, make a donation to support our virtual programming. Okay, let me stop sharing and see if you have some questions. I see one has come in. Do you know if there were people who wrote books for children back then that encouraged people to be compassionate to people who are Jewish that students got in some schools? Wow, that would be great to, to believe. I don't know of any people who are publishing that. Um, I can't imagine that the Nazis would have allowed publications. You know they were restricting what books people could read and limiting them. So um, I think books that promoted compassion or tolerance, those were not available. They were not coming out in Germany in the 1930s under Nazi rule. Okay, well, thanks very much for tuning into our program. And I look forward to seeing you at our next program or in the future. Be well, everybody. Thanks very much.